So my name is uh, Curtis Moore. I'm the Senior VP of Marketing and Corporate Development for Energy Fuels. Uh, Energy Fuels has been uh, the, the largest uh, U.S. uranium producer uh, over the last several years. Uh, of course, uranium is the fuel for uh, nuclear energy. Uh, and also in the last uh, few years, we've uh, entered the rare earth element space, which is a particularly exciting uh, a place for us to be because there's a lot of growth uh, for rare earths, uh, for things like electric vehicles, wind energy, batteries, and, and whatnot. So uh, happy to be here with you, Matt. Curtis, uh, good, good to see you. I know you're on the road. In fact, you're over here in Europe. What are you doing over here? <laughs> yep, I'm uh, I'm here at the Hague uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, the, uh, the the World Nuclear Fuel Conference is uh, ongoing right now. It just uh, just started last night, and uh, the main sessions are today. And uh, it's uh, incredible how many people are here. Uh, they said that there's over 300 people here from around the world. Uh, the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, which is really a reflection of just how much excitement there is around the world for nuclear energy and also the challenges in the nuclear fuel cycle. Well, uh, well, you're not kidding. Actually, we were meant to be there. It was full. We couldn't get in. <laughs> We couldn't even pull any right, strings right. to get in. So, you know, there's what it seems to me looking at those sort of attendee lists, there's lots of industry players, you know, you know, for, for investors, they probably aren't aware of, of all the names, but of the public companies that are there, which are not too many, you're there to do what? We are here to sell uranium. Um, you know, our company, uh, like I said, has actually been producing uranium. In fact, I think uh, we were the only one to produce uranium in the United States of any material quantity last year. Uh, we're currently ramping up uh, several of our uh, uh, uranium mines in the United States. Uh, we did enter into some long-term contracts with uh, nuclear utilities last year, uh, but we do have more uranium to sell uh, at increasingly higher prices. And so that's what we're here to do is, uh, is, is uh, continue to be in the game. Okay, well, it, that, that's kind of interesting to me. It's certainly interesting to me in the context of the news from yesterday and, and this morning about um, a lot of... Um, NATO countries kind of looking to freeze out Russian uranium, Russian enriched uranium as well. So there's 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 definitely conversations afoot. Um, I will love to see how that plays out in the next few weeks or so. But what does that mean for people like you when you're having these conversations at The Hague with utilities? Yes, um, I would say that uh, it, it's an interesting time for the industry. Uh, you know, the, the basic supply and demand fundamentals for uranium and nuclear fuel are as strong as ever. I mean, the, the investment thesis just on those basic fundamentals is extremely compelling. And it's actually getting even more compelling, uh, you know, with as, as uranium mines deplete, as there's, uh, you know, bottlenecks with uh, conversion and enrichment. And then there's also all this talk uh, about really significant increases in uh, nuclear energy around the world. A lot of talk about climate change and how nuclear is really the only way that you're going to significantly get to net zero or reduce carbon emissions. But then you add to that, the other, I'd say, big theme over here is security of supply. And uh, of course, that, that was really sharpened with uh, Russia's, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Russia, of course, is a major supplier of, uh, of nuclear fuel uh, all the way down to uranium. And so uh, people are, uh, in, and utilities in particular, are, are very uh, careful about who they want to do business with. They don't want to be funding a war in Ukraine. And uh, we, we all know there's been recent uh, news coverage that uh, Rosatom, uh, which is the, uh, the Russian nuclear company, is directly aiding in the war effort. Uh, they were a big part of taking over the Ukrainian nuclear power plant. And so uh, I'd say most players in the, in the space, are, are they want to shift away from your, uh, Russia as quickly as they can. And, and, and what so are, they'll come to, come to companies like us. Right. Well, I'll say, I think that's the point. Is, I, I guess the, and, the important question is, and certainly for investors looking at companies like yourself, is how do you take advantage of this situation? How do you take advantage of this 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 unfortunate narrative that that, that we, we have at the moment with regards to nuclear and therefore uh, uranium? So I guess the conversations you're having this week in The Hague are going to be really, really important for you as a company and you as, you as an industry more, more broadly. So um, who, who are the parties um, that you are trying to reach? Is it just purely the utilities? It's mainly the utilities, yes. And of course, our focus is on North American utilities, but uh, all those guys are over here as well. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, 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 and the utilities are focused on, on all aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on conversion, uh, uranium conversion. There's a lot of focus on enrichment. Uh, but I just sat through a session a minute ago where uh, the the CEO of uh, Eureka, uh, which is the large European enrichment company, is out there saying, we have enough enrichment. If you want to move away, uh, U European U.S. utilities, if you want to move away from Russia, they have the enrichment capacity, which was very uh, heartening for me to hear. Um, and again, just the, the, it's it's 
the, these utilities are are looking to people like us to try to to, to fill that gap. And uh, you know, look, we're not going to be producing 10, 20 million pounds of energy fuels, but we can certainly supply a few million pounds into this market. So, but but what I found interesting when I was looking at the attendee list was there's not a lot of public companies there. Okay, um, and I don't know if that's a fa- the factor of well, I don't know what it's a factor of, but if you're not there, you, you're not in the room. And if you're not in the room, you can't have the conversation. So is it because they're not quite ready for those conversations or are there other factors of, uh, at play here? Yeah. I mean, look, if you don't have the permits, if you don't have your projects financed, uh, much less developed, you know, there's there's not a lot that a utility needs to talk to you about, right? You know, they have they have challenges that are right in front of them in the next couple of years. And so, you know, I'm sure that they, they you know, they they're interested in hearing about projects that are going to come online in five, 10, 15 years. But, you know, that's really not their focus right now. So that's why they're talking to, to guys like us that have the proven capacity to actually increase uranium production uh, very, very quickly. And so uh, we're, 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 we're interested to see where those conversations go, for sure. OK, well, um, I, I guess you'll feed back into the market, you know, if, as those conversations evolve or, or, or come to some uh, level of conclusion in terms of contracts, et cetera. Um, obviously, let, let's, let's go back home uh, for a second. Though. Obviously, you mentioned Rare Earths, um, Alta Mesa, part of the kind of critical minerals hub that you're building um, out there. Um, I mean, h- how are things advancing on that front? Yeah, so uh, so we're uh, pr- uh, producing a rare earth element out of the White Mesa Mill. Uh, of course, White Mesa Mill is the only conventional uranium mill left in the United States, but just a few years ago, we uh, discovered that it can also play a big role in uh, uh, bringing back rare earth production in the United States. So uh, we've been doing a crack and leach and producing a, a mixed rare earth carbonate uh, for the last couple of years uh, on small commercial scale. And we've been selling that to a separation facility in Europe. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if your, your listeners were aware of this, but uh, we have made the uh, investment decision to install rare earth separation capabilities where uh, we have ordered up the equipment. Uh, we started construction out of the White Mesa Mill. Uh, it's going to cost in the order of $20, $25 million uh, to allow us to produce up to 1,000 metric tons of neodymium praseodymium oxide, or NDPR oxide, as it's known, uh, per year. And hopefully by this time next year, uh, subject to us getting enough feed, uh, we could be producing enough NDPR oxide for up to a million electric vehicles per year, which is a, a pretty phenomenal jump for, for, for energy fuels. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just as exciting as uranium. So we've got uh, two commodities that we've got very good exposure to. And, and vanadium <laughs> and recycling. Well, <laughs> and, well you're right. Yeah. You have vanadium as well. The vanadium as well. Yep. But yeah, it, 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 uh, it, it all sounds good. Curtis, look, I, I know you, you said a few minutes before you kind of dashed off the conference. I know you've got a, a ton of meetings to um, get, get through and a lot of important people to uh, meet up. So look, I appreciate the update. Good to see you out on the road. Um, good to see you having those conversations. Let us know how you get on when you get back. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks for the opportunity, Matt.